Okay, welcome back. This is now, I believe, video 10 in our series on thermochemistry and thermodynamics. And right now we're focusing on enthalpy. And let's take a look at a rather unique way of getting to the delta H or the enthalpy of a reaction. Remember, delta H is a state function meaning all that matters is our final state and our initial state. It is independent of the pathway that is taken between the final and the initial. So we can get information about enthalpies of reactions. Maybe it's a reaction that is difficult to measure or maybe not safe to do. And, or, or maybe we simply want to get a, an initial value, a starting point, so that we can set up our process uh, well. And so what we can do is take things that we know and add them up to get something maybe we don't know. Now, we did something very similar in equilibrium, so I'm going to link this to the prior knowledge of equilibrium. Uh, we saw adding reactions when we did mechanisms, and we're going to see it again in electrochemistry. So boy, we want to make sure we get a good handle on how we uh, flip and add and multiply reactions. So let's take a look at this. If we reverse or flip a reaction, remember what we did with K is we took the inverse of K. Now, you're literally writing it reverse. Instead of A going to B, you're writing it as B going to A. Now, hopefully, it's logical to you that if a reaction is endothermic in one react, uh, direction, it'd be exothermic in the other. So what we do is we change the sign. So instead of taking the inverse, if it was positive, we make it negative. If it was negative, we make it positive. Now, if we multiply a reaction by a factor, by a balancing coefficient, in K, do you remember that we raised K to the power of that factor? So if we multiplied by 2, we squared K. If we multiplied by a half, we took K to the 1 half, or took the square root of K. For delta H, it's really nice. If you multiply a reaction by a factor, you simply multiply delta H by that same factor. And by the way, everything we're talking about applies to free energy as well. So we'll see one of those later on. So multiply delta H by that factor. In other words, if it takes 10 joules for A to go to B, is it logical that it takes 20 joules are released when two A's go to two B's? Okay, so that's the concept there. Now, if you add reactions, in K world, we multiplied our K values. Here, if you add reactions, you simply add the delta H values. So let's see this in action. Uh, we have a series of known reactions here, and we are given a goal reaction. We want to find the heat of combustion for one mole. This is very, very important. One mole of ethane. What that means is we have to balance the reaction such that we have one mole of ethane as our reactant. So here's my goal reaction. You always want to write that down because that's going to help us know how to manipulate this. So my, I've got ethane, C2H6. It's a combustion. We assume complete combustion unless there's indicators otherwise. Plus H2O. Since we want this for one mole, we have to put a one there, which means we need a two here, a three here, and a seven halves here. Remember, we can't do this in the reaction section, but that's acceptable in other contexts. So let's evaluate what we have here. I, I just pick one to start with. It, it really is kind of random, almost like balancing is a little random here. I'm just going to start with the first thing in the reaction. I have C2H6. So I need it as a reactant. It only shows up once up here. That's key. If it shows up twice, blow it off and go on to something else, and I promise you it will fall back into place. It shows up up here, but it shows up as a product. 
That means I have to reverse that reaction in order to get it as a reactant. Now, I'm being a little sloppy here for time's sake, but you've got all the states in front of you, and those states are important. You can't cross off different states of matter here. Uh, so when I cross off my products and my reactants, they have to be the same state. Okay, but since everything is pretty much in the same state, I'm not too worried about it. Since I reverse this reaction, if it's exothermic in this direction, in the opposite direction, it must be endothermic. So I have 84.68. Okay, now the next thing that I have is oxygen. Now oxygen shows up in two places here. So you know what, I'm going to ignore it. It'll fall into place, I promise you. And instead I'm going to focus on CO2. CO2 shows up as a product here and here, but the difference is this two. I need two moles of CO2. So I'm going to multiply that whole reaction by 2. Now remember, if you multiply by a factor, you, if you multiply the reaction by a factor, you also multiply the delta H by a factor. Okay. Now, I've got H2 here and it doesn't show up in my goal reaction. Um, I want to focus on the H2O. I have it as a product here, it's a product here, but I have three of them. So I need three H2O, so I'm going to multiply that whole reaction by three. So one half times three is three halves, O2, and three H2O. And if I multiply a reaction by three, I multiply my K, or excuse me, my delta H. Sorry, I'm in equilibrium land there. I multiply my delta H by three as well. That's a 286. Okay. Now, you always, always, always want to do a double check that everything canceled the way you anticipated it would. And two solid carbons on the product, two on the reactant, those cancel. 3H2, and they were gases all throughout, 3H2 cancel. So that's everything that cancels. Now you just carry everything else down. So I've got C2H6 to carry down. I've got four halves and three halves, so I've got seven halves oxygen. So that takes care of that. I've got two CO2 and three H2O. So indeed, I did get to my goal reaction. And my final delta H is simply the sum of all of those, which is minus 1561 kilojoules. Now, that's per reaction is written. So that's per one mole of this, per seven halves mole of this, per two moles of CO2, and three moles of H2O. Okay, let's see how this works in other contexts and can help us with a couple of other contexts here. This, these two diagrams show us heats of solution and how we can use Hess's law to determine how much heat is involved, either absorbed or re released, in dissolving uh, a substance. So whenever you dissolve a substance, step one is you have to break the, the forces of attraction between your solute molecules. And that is going to be an exothermic, or excuse me, I just misspoke, an endothermic process. Breaking forces of attraction requires energy. Then you have to break some, at least, of the forces of attraction between solvent molecules, those intermolecular forces. That, too, is endothermic. And so this picture would show you an example where that's the sum of the H1 plus H2 going up in energy because, indeed, it is endothermic. Okay? Now, uh, once that's done, we can then start forming forces of attraction among solute and solvent molecules. And it is certainly possible that there's more than one solvent per solute. Now, whenever you form forces of attraction, you release energy. So that is an exothermic process. And if I add it up, the, the three, the delta H1 plus delta H2, 
2 plus delta H 3. Okay, that's a positive, that's a positive. In this first case, A, that's a negative. I get my delta H of solution. So that's really a Hess's Law application. Uh, I could write that on in reaction form, but I'm not going to get into that aspect of it right now. Uh, this one shows an endothermic, overall endothermic process. Remember, endo here, endo here, forming forces of attraction is always an exothermic process. At forming forces releases energy. So this releases energy here, but the reason why it's overall endo is the energy that has to be put in is greater than the energy that comes out of our process. So we have a net having to kind of suck in energy, so to speak. Now, remember, that doesn't tell us whether or not it's spontaneous. We would have to look at uh, some of the aspects of our entropy changes to determine whether it is spontaneous. The most we can say here is that this is favorable and this is unfavorable. That does not mean it's not spontaneous. And in fact, you're supposed to remind me to show you one in class. Now, this is just showing this same concept in table form. And it's a polar solvent and a polar solute. Since these are since the solute's polar, it takes a lot of energy to break the intermolecular forces. Since the solvent's polar, it requires a lot of energy to break those intermolecular forces. Now, polar and polar, that's a strong attraction. So it's going to release a lot of energy. Now, our net is going to be small. And our outcome is, hmm, like dissolves like. Polar dissolves polar, and it gets back to the energetics and really goes all the way back to structure and function. Polar and nonpolar, let's take a look at this. Nonpolar typically, if it's small, is going to have small intermolecular, weak intermolecular formulas, so, uh, intermolecular forces, sorry. Um, the polar solvent is going to be large. And the attractive forces are just too small to overcome that large component here. So we end up with large and positive, and the net is no solution forms. Like and unlike. Remember, like dissolves like. So no solution, no solution forms, no solution forms. Like dissolves like, solution forms, like dissolves like. And it's all about balance of energy. Okay, that's it for our little focus on enthalpy. In our next video, we're going to focus on free energy. And that will be it. Just a couple of uh, things we want to clean up about free energy. So until then, this is signing off.